I'm your host, Tyler Sanders, and I'm with Gateway Professors, Dr. Greg Watson and Dr. Paul Kelly. I thought we should forego official titles, so I'm just going to kind of declare Dr. Watson uh, Old Testament dude. <laughs> and Dr. Kelly, uh, education bro. Are Is you, that okay? Do you, we think we're in the right zone right you now? You could call me GY if you want. <laughs> there you go, yeah. So uh, this podcast, what we talk about are challenges to Bible teaching. Really, what we're trying to figure out is how to teach the Bible well. So we're going to hit challenges. We're going to look through a text, kind of walk through it, see how that kind of works with the, the problem we bring up. And then we're going to spin the wheel. Mm-hmm. And the wheel is going to give us a teaching context. We're going to try to take what we've learned and apply it on the fly. <laughs> so, Dr. Watson, what's our topic today? We wanted, I wanted to talk about why we teach. I mean, why do we teach? And, you know, you'd think it'd be really an easy question to answer. Um, well, because, you know, the Bible says to, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, but when you get right down to it, um, there's, there's got to be more than just saying we do it. We do it because we got to have somebody to teach a Sunday school class because <laughs> right. our children need to know something. Our adults need to know things. And uh, that's that's good and that's laudable. But, you know, we got we got to have a bigger target, bigger motivation behind us. Yeah. Than well, that. I think I think that really is kind of a kind of a challenging issue, because sometimes, you know, you get so caught up in trying to prepare a lesson on Sunday morning, you know, or you're trying to run it or or a Bible study for Tuesday night or, 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 or something that happens on Sunday night. And so you're, you know, pulling out the quarterly or you're pulling out your Bible and looking at your commentary or you're doing whatever you do to prepare. And it's like you never stop to consider what is this about? What are we really trying to mm. accomplish? And if we're not careful, we end up just, the Bible study becomes perfunctory. You know, right. it becomes something we just do, not something that we have purpose in, not something that right. we're, we're, we're doing with intention and with, and with, with clear purpose. Yeah. Well, we always, you know, we always approach a passage that we're going to be teaching. Look at the Sunday school lesson, or, or if you do it a little bit more independently like I do, you always try and find what's the message here, mm, mm. and you want to teach you that. And that's that's great. That's what we do. Mm. But I'm really talking about something a little bit bigger, a little mm. bit more profound that, that lies behind our motivations and what we do to teach. Um, I did some study uh, in this some time ago, but... You know, our, the starting place for me, virtually everything we do is always the Great Commission. Mm, mm, um, mm. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, name, them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Right? <laughs> and, I mean, boy, that's a lot. Yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> and But, but what's, what's really interesting about that is when Jesus says, all that I have commanded you, if you go back into Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy— you're going to see over and over and over again the the, the phrase, just as I have commanded, mm, just mm, as I commanded mm. Moses, just as Moses was commanded, you know, that, that God has laid down these commands. Um, and the interesting thing is, is we're not just to teach the commands. Right, hmm. right. When you get into that and you start unpacking, um, like in, in uh, Deuteronomy 6, which we call the Shema there, what you find is, is you find these little the things that, look, when your children ask you, Dad, why do we do this? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, well, why, why do we obey this command? Yeah. He unfolds it, he unpacks it, and he does it. He says, because God did this for us. Right. And this was the result of it, and this is what God wants for it. So, um, you know, we, we've got a good grasp of that. You know, we do a pretty good job of nailing those things down. Um and you may have some ideas about this, Paul, about um, how that works out. But but you know what what do you see as an even greater motivation? Behind well, yeah, that? I mean, I I do think that that you know we need to teach with the idea that we're commanded to teach and that we're passing on, but. You know, some of our teaching sometimes gets really us focused. Okay, what do I need to know? What do I need to do? And it seems like to me that there's mm. a real need for us to not just focus on the, you know, the, the the stuff that's perfunctory, the stuff that I have to know, or the stuff that I've, I'm supposed to be able to do, but that I want to really get a sense of um, who, who this 
God is that we serve and, and what he's about and how that affects my life. I mean, one of the problems that we have sometimes in teaching, especially when we start to talk about, you know, children's ministry, maybe, you know, is that all of our teaching gets to be moralistic, you know, and mm. where the Bible says do this and don't do that. Well, we end up spending a lot of time doing that, you know, teaching the moralistic stuff, be nice to your bro- little brother, you know, and and uh, and uh, obey your parents and all that. And all that stuff is, is fine, except if we're not careful, we miss the purpose behind all of that, right? right? That that instead of being um, focused on trying to teach in a way that helps people to, to develop this dynamic, mysterious relationship with their creator, that we uh, just give mm. them a set of, of principles to follow or a set of morals to obey. And, and we miss the fact that the Bible is supposed to be so much richer than that, that it's not just revealing to us concepts, it's revealing to us a person, you know? I really, in that same line, I'm I'm really interested not just in communicating information and things that people need to know. That tends, tends to be what we do in teaching and preaching. Learning is a very passive thing in that sense, and that's mm. what we do a lot of. Mm. In fact, I think you see um, in, in popular Christian culture, people are not going to learn how to discover these things. For them. They're looking for the guru to show them the way and give them the teaching <laughs> right. so that they can go just do it, and it all just works fine for them. Um, and I think what what you end up with is people who never mature out of being fed, like baby birds. Mm. Right, right, right. And um, so, you know, I think one of the motives in teaching is to teach people not only to feed themselves, but to teach. Right, right, right. Become purveyors. Yeah, 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 yeah. (laughs) There is is a tendency for us to want to take Scripture, digest it for ourselves, and then just just regurgitate (laughs) or throw it back up, you know? And so it's sort of pre-digested food by the time you're you're taking it in. And really to engage with Scripture in a personal kind of way, that's a whole other thing, you know, because then I'm chewing on it for myself, you know, and I start to, to be able to get things. Maybe that has something to do with what Paul's talking about when he says, you know, you should be drink, eat meat by now, but you're still drinking milk, you know, that right. there's this, this need for us to be able to feast on the word for ourselves and not just, you know, be babies that are sucking on the bottle yeah. and, and taking whatever's, whatever's given to us. So I think you're right. I think teaching needs to go beyond just hearing what somebody else has studied and it needs to lead us to engage and study ourselves, maybe in the session, you know, where I'm teaching, maybe uh, in, 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 in t- things that I do after the session's over. You well, know, let, me, you know go ahead. let me ask you a question. So, because uh, you mentioned teaching and preaching uh-huh. a second ago, and that's always an interesting distinction, I think. And there's a lot of ways to approach that. So I, I think in the vein of this line of thinking we're in right now, what would be an answer to this question, like, why do we teach versus, like, why do we preach? What would the differences be in well, those? My answer, but look, I am not a preacher. I can't preach, but it comes out of teaching. My, I believe that my task, and I, I'm, I know I'm speaking for a lot of people that may disagree with that, but my job is not to, to give application. My job is to expound the Word of God. Mm. The eternal food, the spiritual food, the thing that carries authority is the Word of God not whatever application I can draw from it. So I don't want, I don't want to, to downplay making application, but I think far too much of our preaching spends way too little, too little time helping people understand the text and going to do the application. And because of that, they're not challenged to think through. So if this is what it meant, if this, is, if this really is what that text is saying, they can see for themselves where the application yeah. falls, you know? Yeah. That to me shows that next stage of development and learning and maturity. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I think I think that's true. But I also think that largely, I mean, when I start reading the books that get really popular in Christian circles, they tend to be things that are so basic that I'm like, is mm. this really where we yeah. are? You know. And so I think that for a lot of people, the idea of making the connection between what this says and what I do on Monday is kind of lost on them. So I think that there is a need to do that. But back to your question, I think that for me. Um, the biggest difference that I see in what I do when I preach and what Mm -hmm. I do when I teach is that I 
always want to teach with the sense that I'm looking for learning to happen. Now, mm. th- th- in some ways, that's true with preaching too, yeah, right? Sure, yeah. And so, you know, I can, and the way that I can get feedback and see that learning happen is I look out at the audience as I'm yeah. talking or the congregation as I'm talking. And if they're nodding their heads or, you know, giving me those, you know, those looks like, oh, that's tough, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's then, then I kind of get this feedback that something is happening. Yeah. But one of the problems that we have in terms of biblical knowledge at all is that largely people cannot, Christians today cannot articulate their faith beyond the feeling level, that largely Mm. Christians really can't explain to you what they believe about simple things, or or, or, or they they can't express what the church teaches about certain doctrines. They can't Mm. express what the, 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 the gospel story is, you know, and because, and I think a lot of that is because we've leaned so much into, as Greg says, regurgitating the word, you know, to yeah. people, right. and we've never asked them to talk back about what they've heard, mm. that I actually think that learning takes place as I'm not just hearing what's said, but as I start to, to, to flesh that out for myself and put it into words for myself, and I develop the language to be able to say that, and while I can't very easily accomplish that in a sermon, you know, I mean, maybe there's some ways we could get to that, but in a Bible study, we have lots of opportunities for back and forth dialogue, for yeah, discovery, for of. questions, for yeah. you know those kinds of things. And those things aren't just byproducts; those things are the learning experiences. Right. Yeah, you, I keep I keep bouncing your question. What's the difference between preaching and teaching? And like I said, for me, uh, there's not a great distinction, mm. but. You know, and, uh, you know, I sat under a, 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 an excellent uh, expositor and, and preacher uh, at my church, and there's not a great deal of difference for him either in, in the way he presents. Mm. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy as I can be, you know, I'm, I'm uh, but it's, um, if I had to really put my finger on it, again, I don't want to be offensive here, but preaching and most of the preaching that I hear today tends to be about living life under the sun easily. Mm. You know, here's these seven things that'll help you raise your mm, kids. Mm, mm. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. The problem is that those are seven principles that come out, come somewhere, but they're not in that text mm, you're preaching. Mm, mm. Right? Yeah. And what what is something that can motivate us? to stay focused on the purpose of the text. Well, it's, it's got to be the God who delivered it. Mm, mm, you know, mm, what's mm. my motivation for thinking this text is more important for my people that I'm preaching to or, or whatever the context? It's more important that they understand what this text has and, and why, who gave it to them, yeah. than it is how they can make this this you know, fairly almost obvious application yeah. in their lives. That's so good. Y- you know, there's a, a lot of discussion or in recent years. There's been a lot of discussion over what cr- the term that Christian Smith coined that he called moralistic therapeutic deism. I'm sure, yeah. Where essentially what Smith says is that largely— mm. Many people who are Christians today have sort of a moralistic faith. They think that God just wants them to be good people, you know, and they want it to be a therapeutic faith, that it makes me feel good, that it makes me happy, and that it, that it tends to be deistic, not in the sense that they have this dynamic personal relationship with God that's ongoing, where he convicts them and moves in their lives and directs them and that kind of stuff, but that they have a God who sort of is up there someplace, you know, and watching over us as we, right. as we live our lives. And once in a while, will dip down and help us if we get into a lot of trouble. And I, and I think that a, a, a vision of faith like that leaves us sort of really shallow. And I think it does lean into the Bible being um, all about morals, rules that I'm supposed to follow, all about, you know, concepts that I'm supposed to believe and not about this engagement with 
the living God. Uh, and, and I think as yeah. we get into scripture, I mean, that's one of the things that we get like from, from this deal with, with Jesus coming, you know, I, I love the way John presents the, the arrival of Christ, you know, where he basically just sort of wants to pull back the curtain and say, in the beginning, I know that you've heard in the beginning, God <laughs> created or yeah. God was creator, you know, is, but, but that, that he says in the beginning was the word lots of funny things about yeah. that, but was yeah. the word, was Jesus, that he was present and that there's this revelation of him, not concepts, ideas, but but that the revelation mm. of him. And uh, I, I don't know, that, that, that picture becomes so strong that the disciples weren't following ideas, you know, in the first century that they were following Jesus. Mm. Um, it seems like that we ought to be helping people to do that as well. Well, here's yeah. here's another aspect to that, and I'm I'm becoming more and more uh, oriented to the idea that at least in the Old Testament, if there's a theological ideal that kind of spans it all, it's the effective presence of God among His people. Mm. It's where they get their identity. It's where mm, wisdom mm, comes. It's where mm, obedience mm. comes from. And the interesting thing is, is that when we when we when we're in uh, Genesis two, we see God in this perfect relationship. You know with mankind and stuff. We don't know how much time is expanding and stuff like that. But once the fall happens, we never see God in any kind of permanent presence among his people until we get to the tabernacle. Mm. And, 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 you know, Exodus 19 through 40. Yeah. And I, I find that fascinating because every single motive God has for bringing the people out of Egypt to that mountain mm. is like you said, it's this dynamic personal relationship with the presence of God, and and it just it's it's it really is an awesome dynamic that, you know, that's one of the things we don't see hmm. because we're looking at no you got to be obedient here, but what is what lies behind that obedience? Mm-hmm. What is that to drive that obedience? That's so good. That's so good. Hmm. Well, yeah. Let's get into the text a little bit. All right, can we do that? What's your text for us today? So. Um, kind of going along this line, and it'll take a second to kind of explain how this fits, but I wanted to look at Hebrews 1, 1 through 4, um, and I'll explain it after I read this. Says, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Who is this about? Yeah, yeah. It's Who a, is this about? That's Jesus. Yeah, it's about that's Jesus. Jesus. That's yeah, and and it's about it's about this triune God mm. that that is is the Creator and and uh, all these things. Um, how does how, you know how, why do we teach? Well, it's about Jesus, isn't it? Mm-hmm. But I want you to show you something. There are two time frames that are in view here. Long ago, and many times, and in many ways. All right, so there's not just one. You know, there's 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 also that, but long ago in the past. God spoke to our ancestors mm. by the prophets. Mm. So you've got a time frame, you've got the source, you've got the communicator, the prophets. And then in verse 2, he says, but in these last days, olden days, these present days, these present mm-hmm. times, mm-hmm. Um, he, the Father, has spoken to us by whom? By his son. son. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Whom he appointed heir of all things, who is the king, and so forth. So, man, what this is this is so huge because now what we have is the things that are in the past, the things that have been exposited and proclaimed and insisted on by the people throughout the ages are now coming to a head in the form of Jesus Christ. Yeah. My view uh about about the Old Testament's relationship to the new in terms of its eschatology, its view on the last things, mm-hmm. is that the Old Testament casts a picture uh, eschatologically toward the coming of Messiah, mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. toward Jesus' coming. It's really interesting because we've got these metaphors, you know, Jesus is prophet, I mean, the Messiah is prophet, priest, king, counselor. Mm-hmm. 
Um, but those things are very separate, and very distinct. There, there are very few passages that really bring those together in a clear mm, way sure. so that we don't have a clear picture of what Messiah was going to look like. No wonder they're so confused when Jesus mm, comes. Yeah, they're looking mm. for a king. They're looking for someone to come and fight off the Romans. Right. They're, you know, and all these different things. But they never really considered them together. Mm. And it's only when we get Jesus in these last days. Yeah. You know, when when we see all of those those uh, those streams coming together with clarity into who Jesus Christ was and what he was going to do, yeah. that we actually have the object of why we have a Bible and why we teach it. Mm, that's mm. so good. That's so good. Mm. You know, I've been playing with this idea for a while um, that uh, that part of the problem of humanity is that we so quickly forget God, you know, mm. that that remembering stuff is easy, remembering, you know, our history as a country or whatever, all that stuff, you know, is is so much easier. But but it's like Adam and Eve walked with God. They knew God. Even when they were kicked out of the garden, they still know God. They know who he is. They 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 have at least some interaction with him. Cain and Abel, their their children, know God. But you know, you don't get very far into that mm-hmm. that history before all of a sudden you have all these people who just don't know who God is. They they've forgotten God, and so he, he like you like you described in this verse that that they keep using that that God keeps using the the prophets and and the 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 the, the, the leaders, the kings, the the uh, the the judges to try to give them a reminder of who God is. And I think that at least part of the reason why. Uh, God calls to himself a people from himself, you know, beginning with Abraham, why he calls a people to himself is to provide a, a, a constant reminder to the world that he is the God that is, that he's the God ah. that exists, you know? Mm. And all of that seems to not really effectively give people this long-term knowledge of him, that it seems like it doesn't take many generations for us just to forget him. Right. And then he sends his son who, if nothing else, is the perfect image of God, the, the, the one who reveals who God is. And it seems like to me that it's easy for us to talk about principles and, 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 and morals and stuff like that. Knowing God, knowing who he is, being able to remember that there is a God who's active, who's working, who's engaged in my life, that's it's kind of a different thing. And, and I think that part of what we get to do every time we open the Bible is not just give people sort of the, the truth about this concept or something like that, but to remind them that God is, that God exists, and that he's been revealed most fully in Jesus. We point... We point ourselves and point our efforts so much to life and survival. It's a tough world to survive in. Mm-hmm. It's a tough world to live in. And we point ourselves so much to what I said a minute ago, to life under the sun. That word, that, that little phrase right out of Ecclesiastes. We mm-hmm. point ourselves to life under the sun so often that our, our eyes rarely are able to kind of lift above the clouds, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, and to, to see and remember that it's, no, there's, there's a God they say, yeah, there's poor, it's, it's important to, to lay these ethical and moral kind of boundaries around things. But, you know, we need to have our eyes open to know and to see and to understand the God that has laid all this out for us. That, is, that You know, that we know him through his word. Mm. Very few of us are ever going to sit down and have a conversation right. like this with God. Right. Well, maybe Physically. someday. <laughs> someday we will. But, you know, here under the sun. Yeah. You know, we we have the stirring of the Holy Spirit. We have the presence of the Holy Spirit. Um, But we're not going to have Jesus standing sitting across for us to talk at this point. And so how do we get to know God? Well, you know... Yeah, that's part of what our task as teachers is, isn't it? Right, yeah. right, yeah, to show yeah. And, and really, I mean, if we were going to sum it up in like really, really simple, simple language, I think I think that's what we would say. I think that we teach to help people to know God, to help yeah. people to know Jesus, to help not not just know about Him, but to know Him. So I'm taking notes over here, you know, so I can try to come up with like good zingers and stuff towards the end. And, I'm, and, I'm, and it helps me just kind of like summarize and think yeah. this up. And the word I wrote down first wasn't no, it was introduce. Mm, mm, I think mm. that may actually be, I, I, I was like, oh, that's the wrong word. As soon as I wrote it, I was like, that's not quite right. But it kind of kind fits of is. in a yeah. way. Because like you were saying earlier that it doesn't take long 
you know, when we read the Old Testament, like generations, people forget about God, but it's, it's a lot faster than that. Mm -hmm. I think all of us experience Mm -hmm. probably on a week to week basis, like (laughs) some point I'm driving and I have forgotten who God is because I'm furious at someone for accidentally cutting me off or like I'm, Mm -hmm. you know, there's something that like I've kind of, I've, I've forgotten I, I've really kind of forgotten who I am in a way and who I am in relation to God. And so like there is a sense of like each week when someone comes in to hear preaching or teaching, wherever it is, if it's a small group or, you know, in, in you know, a formal kind of church setting, whatever it is, like there is kind of a reintroduction that happens, you know, anytime we're, we're reading a, a passage from the Bible. That's so good. There's two sides to this, I think. On the one side, we've got the theology side. Look, we're in a theological seminary. You know, we, I, I'm a biblical theologian. I love systematic theology. I pray for those guys quite often. But, <laughs> but you know, I just I love theology. Yeah. Here's the problem with theology. It's merely descriptive. Mm. It is not mm. God. Mm. Mm. You know, yeah, yeah. And, and when when we start when we start saying God is this. It becomes very easy to take it and set it up on a shelf and say, are you a believer? What do you believe? I believe that. Yeah. This yeah. checklist. Yeah. I believe yeah. that. And, hmm. you know, this is my understanding of this, this Old Testament German scholar, liberal continental German scholar named Gerhard von Rod. But one of the things von Rod got right was that, that the Bible as the Word of God represents a new encounter between God and every community and every generation. Mm. That the reason, the reason, the reason it, it, it the, the tradition that it brings, that it holds is something that may be uh, reinterpreted in every generation, mm. but it's a tradition that stands that people set their, their feet upon. And what he's getting at is there's an encounter that we have with God that cannot be defined by the canons of our belief. Wow. That mm. there's this... There's this dynamic personal encounter and relationship with God that exists beyond what we can explain logically, theologically, critically. Yeah. And and it exists. The problem with postmodernism is that's all it wants to do. Mm-hmm. Is that right, right? And so you lose the boundaries. You lose right. the boundaries around about around where that can go and where that can take you. Huh. So, you know, we we tend to want to go, we tend to fall too far to one side or yeah. the other. Mm. Yeah. And and I think I think what we're what we're talking about here is that look, we are teaching people, we are pointing people to a personal dynamic relationship that while we're temporal, the relationship is not. Mm-hmm. It's an eternal relationship, mm-hmm. and it's something that goes beyond life under the sun. Yeah, um, you know, I was in a church for fifteen years, and we had one, maybe two sermons on the return of Christ. Mm. The rest of it is all about how do we live today and tomorrow. We don't have our eyes above the sun. We need to focus in on the God who promised all this mm-hmm. because it's eternal. Mm. Yeah, that's so good. You know, I, I was kind of thinking about just when I came to Christ, when I was a, in a you know middle school age kid and, and uh, never really heard the gospel until I, a friend of mine invited me to, a, to go to a Baptist church with him and... and uh, heard for the first time the gospel. And and the theology that I understood, you could put in a thimble. I mean, it was just almost nothing. But God was real to me, mm. you know. And yeah. when I when I embraced him, you know, turned to him and asked for his forgiveness and and uh and just embraced his gospel, it was it wasn't, you know, because I got all the words right or because I knew all the the concepts perfectly. It was because I knew that there was a God who mm-hmm. loved me. And I and I think Sometimes we can get so um, heady about our faith that we we miss the fact that God is the God who meets us, that God is the God who we're right. coming to. And and I think that what this passage does, I mean, in such a beautiful way, yeah. is it just paints a picture of the God who reminds us, the God who tells us not by principles or by writing on stone tablets, although he does some of that, but by his own son yeah. being present with mm. us. The you know this idea of God presence, God's presence among us that we talked about a minute ago, the, the whole Emmanuel concept. You know, in the end, that's what we do. That's where we are. This idea that um, I will be their God, they will be my people, and I will dwell with them. Mm-hmm. It it begins 
uh, it's it, we're given the picture in Genesis, but we see it stated over and over again in Exodus and Numbers. But boy, when we get there, when we get to Revelation, mm-hmm. the refrain mm-hmm. occurs mm-hmm. over and over and over again. This is yeah, this is about this God who has made this effort to draw us in. That's why we teach. That's so good. That's why we teach. Well, you guys ready to spin the wheel? Spin the wheel. Let's get it over with. Because this is this is a big it's a big idea, but it's also kind of a simple idea. Yeah. But it's not an easy idea. Mm-hmm. We'll see, we'll see what we get on the on the wheel. All right, if it's hard, you get it. <laughs> This is an adult Sunday school class. Ah. So this wouldn't be, this may not be the hardest. Well, you know, in, in some ways it is though, right? Because nice. when we're talking with kids, they get sort of the personal stuff of Jesus. Yeah. So many times adults bring stuff into the room with them where they want to hear sort of their own theological perspective, or alternatively, they bring in all the things that they think God is up to in the world. And, huh. and sometimes it can be a miss in terms of them really gazing at the living Christ, you know? So, yeah. so I think maybe hmm. when we're teaching adults, calling them to sort of get out of their heads and get into mm. their 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 hearts and into their you know into the, right. the the relational aspect of that may be more of a challenge than it it would seem like at first yeah you know I've I, I've, I've maybe said this in uh, before but I teach an older Sunday school these folks are quite a bit older than me for the most part um, you know mid 60s to around 80 you know and uh, it's really interesting most of the women, have been doing BSF for 40 years. They know the Bible better than I do, you know, (laughs) and and they are really competent to come in there and hear things. And they understand enough that, that they can call you on the carpet if they think you're straying off. But they tend to be the ones that want to call attention to the God and Savior that that we're there to do. It's it's really fascinating. Interesting. It's, It's us dudes that get in there and we want to get down into the weeds and we want to fight over over this little <laughs> nugget or that little nugget. And a lot of times the women will just sit back and let the men go in there. Um, and it's it's really interesting to have to have to corral that and bring it together. Um, my question that I'll throw right back at you guys is how do you get the men to calm down? Mm-hmm. You know, and that's a strange way to put it. How do you get the men out of the weeds? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's a good question. Yeah, I think like I mean, when I think of how you you were talking about how you became a Christian earlier, it, for me, I spent years in church growing up, all through middle school, high school, you know, even younger than that, really. And then uh, my senior year, I graduate, I go to camp one more time, and that was like the first time it really like it just clicked, clicked. you know. But and and I think part of it was like. I had learned a lot of things. I knew a lot of things, but I I didn't know God. That was totally missing. And I think I kind of knew that, and so I was always a little nervous or unsure about my faith. That, that was always a question in my head. And then it was just like, but I that was like a move of the Holy <laughs> Spirit. It was like, because it really shook me out of any kind of self-consciousness or like confidence in myself. It, it, all those things that I had been relying on, all that was gone. Like that was kind of uh, a, like a miracle, I think, you know, mm-hmm. this like spiritual kind of thing that happened. So I don't know exactly what, how you try to bring that into like a classroom week to week, you yeah. know? I've got a theory. Mm-hmm. And I, I had thought about this before we came in here. But, uh, you know, I've got a theory that if we kind of have this focus, this core idea that we're focusing on God, maybe you know, maybe not every aspect, but but our focus, why we teach is is to present this God. Hmm. We've got a kernel there that is dependable, that that doesn't necessarily need to mean we're repeating the same things week after week. Yeah, people want to under they want their faith to make sense, everything to line up, and they want they want all the facts to be there. You know, they want they want to know that yes, there's absolute irrefutable proof that an exodus took place. Hmm. Um, they you know they want to know all these little things that are uncertainties about there. We can't give them those certainties. Hmm. We can say the Bible tells us that the exodus took place and I believe it took place. Yeah. But the Bible's the only place it ever mentions it. 
Yeah. It, it, there's no other direct explicit evidence that, that said it did. So, no, I can't give you, but I can point you to the assurance to the God who mm. brought about the exodus. That's yeah. something that certain it, there. That yeah. There's, yeah. there's certainty counter. there. Yeah. And, it, and, you know, if, if we quit focusing on life under the sun, if we quit focusing so much on, you know, seven principles for, for combing the hair out of your cat's coat, you know, each week. And <laughs> <laughs> that was really facetious, wasn't it? And, and we, start, we start directing it back to understanding the Word of God and pointing to the God who gave it. That's a far more firm foundation for standing on the Word. Bible is the Word of God than these principles that come out of our mm. own minds. Yeah, yeah, sure. You know, I wonder, too, Tyler, if, if, if we focus a little more on mystery— Hmm. And hmm. talk a little more about what we can't know. Yeah. yeah okay, okay. We can define the, the Trinity, but we can't. It's yeah, mystery. Right. You know, right. it's mystery. We we can we can explain who Jesus is. You know, the fact that he's both God and man, fully God and fully man, yeah. all that kind of. But we can't explain that. You know, yeah, it's yeah. mystery. And if we lean a little more into mystery, I wonder if adults start to say, okay, it's not so much getting everything lined up, but it's helping people to, 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 to start to uh, understand that truth is a, is a person, not, right. not a concept. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah, or the, a book the or thing, something. The other thing that I was thinking about, about what you were saying, is that I think so many times we fill up lessons, you know, Bible mm. study meetings and stuff like that with words, you know? Mm. And I wonder if there's a need, especially for adults, if there's a need for more of of a of, of an openness to try to give the Holy Spirit just time to do mm. the things that you said he did for you in camp. Sure. You know? Silence. Is it is yeah. it possible for us just to mm. have time where we're going to spend a little bit of time in personal meditation or personal prayer? Yeah. Or are we going to spend a little bit of time in uh, opportunities to just sort of write down your thoughts about and just give people sort of some silence to be able yeah. to allow the spirit to speak into that maybe that's one of the ways that, that we move from God being conceptual to be to yeah. God being a person that's I, real. I've thought about that before, uh, not to get into much of a tangent, because um, I can go on forever mm. on this kind of rant. I mean, you guys know I didn't have a smartphone for like years and years and years. I do have one now, but that's the, smart of you. Yeah, <laughs> the <laughs> what I, I I find myself doing the thing that I hate, and that it's like anytime there's a moment. I'm like waiting for something. I'm on my phone and I look at something, you know, right. and so I, I'm really, and I, I know I'm not alone in this, but I fill up every, every empty second of my day. I try to have something in there, whether that's uh, work mm. or just entertainment or something just to keep myself. I think it's like a, it, it in some ways it's probably a way to avoid, you know, thinking about things and going through stuff that's more challenging or complex or whatever it is. But I, I I've, been thinking for a while, like, mm. we should find ways to make church the opposite of that, mm. to have that space and that kind of, that that area where we say, like, we can be contemplative here, we can kind of think through stuff and, and sit with some of the uncertainties and the mysteries and and kind of ponder through that. Because we, I do think there's an element of faith that you have to embrace mm. the mystery. You have to kind of, at some point, say... I can't logic my way through the Trinity. I have to hold on to it as tight as I can, but I can't, like, I, I can't take it. There's no, there's not a, an end to the logic there. Like it keeps going and keeps going and keeps going. And you have to, I just, there's a sense I have that we need to find ways to integrate that into our, our church life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, man, we really... Went all the way around on this one, but I think that was that was really good. So I, I think my challenge then for our listeners is to, uh, as Dr. Kelly said, uh, get out of your head a little bit, and maybe as people are preparing lessons this week, try to like find that space and a little bit of emptiness to really yeah. sit in the text and really engage with it, and try to because I don't think if you're doing that on the preparation side, it's probably going to be hard to. Bring that into the good teaching right. side. You, you really do have to kind of have that mindset and, and discipline yourself to continue to do that consistently. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah, that's good. That's really good. Okay, thank you so much for listening. We'll, uh, we'll catch you guys in the next one. Mm -hmm.